morning. Good morning. I'm Mrs. Johnston. I'm very pleased to meet you. <clears throat> Welcome to Winchester Abbey, where we sisters dedicate our lives to praying to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. How can I help you? Uh, well, I'm here to see my sister, Sister Abigail. Sister Abigail? Yes, uh, you were expecting me, weren't you? Your sister Abigail's sister? Yes, uh, though I tend to go by the name of Judy if we're on first name terms. You've come here to visit Sister Abigail? Yes. Uh, why so surprised? She's not dead, is she? No, at least I hope not. I did check on her this morning and she was breathing, but now you're asking, I'm beginning to think that... I was only having a joke. Oh, a joke. Yes. You were only having a joke. Yes. Now, Mrs Johnston, can I ask you a question? Of course. I hate to pry, but are you what one might call an American? Well, I was born here, but I've lived in the States for over half my life. Oh, wow. I've never met an American before. Well, you've got one right in front of you. And she is rather cold out here, if uh, you'd like to... What? Invite her in. Sorry? Oh, yes, of course, Mrs. Johnston. Come on in. Thank you. Oh, thank goodness for central heating. Would you like me to take your coat? Oh, yes, thank you. I'm sorry I sounded suspicious. I was just a tad surprised. I usually write down when we're expecting a visitor. I didn't have anything written down. I write almost everything down. I didn't have anything written down, see? Maybe Abigail forgot to mention it. In any case, I've got a letter from her here. It says she wants to discuss something with me, something about a story. Oh, Sister Abigail does love telling stories. My favourite one she tells is about how when she was a little girl, she went to Mass one Sunday morning, and then when she was lining up to get her blessing, she realised she... <laughs> she realised... What? She realised she was wearing her trousers back to front. Oh, hey, you should ask her to tell you that one while you're here. <laughs> I think you might have ruined the punchline there. I'll just call Sister Frances. She sorts out all of the admin. Sister Frances? It's Sister Prue. I've got Sister Abigail's sister here, Mrs Johnston. She's really very lovely. And she says she's come to see Sister Abigail. Sorry? Prime Minister? No, Sister Francis. Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister. You're a sister here at the convent, remember? Sister Francis, perhaps we could discuss this another time. Is Sister Abigail with you? Could you please put Sister Abigail on the line? Sister Abigail, how are you? Yeah, your sister's here to see you. She's very excited. Fantastic. Do be careful as you're coming down the stairs. I'd hate for you to trip or have an accident. I'll see you in a moment. So I just spoke to Sister Frances. She does her best to sort out all of the admin, but she's quite senile mind. Sister Abigail says that Sister Frances is one pashmina short of a wardrobe, but Sister Frances insists that you can't shoot the messenger, especially at her age. <gasps> Bless her. Oh, and Sister Abigail says that she'll be downstairs in the parlour in five minutes. Or oh, was it ten minutes? Oh, I didn't write it down. No worries. I should have written it down. That's fine. I usually write everything down, see? I should warn you that Sister Abigail takes that little bit longer to get ready. She was in a car accident when she was a teenager. Or was it when she was younger than that, maybe? It broke her legs terribly. 
but they still look lovely sort of frail and strong at the same time yes well i know about the accident sister prue i know about the accident sister prue terrible business that indeed funny i used to have a lecturer at university called prue although as i seem to recall she went by the name of prudence I thought she was an unbearable know-it-all. Uh, but I very much like the look of you. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Johnston. I was actually christened Prudence. My parents said they called me Prudence because by the time I was two weeks old, I still hadn't cried and I'd shown Prudence in character. That means I could govern and discipline myself through the use of reason. Although Sister Abigail says that I compensate for it now because I'm emotionally labile. Her insults are still as scathing as ever then. More of an intuitive person than a logical one. That's what Sister Abigail says. I see. Sister Prue, I got the impression you were surprised that I was here. Yeah, I suppose I was a bit. Why is that? Well... Sister Abigail speaks the Queen's English, and you sound like you're, you know, from across the pond. Oh, I see. Um, well, that's what living in New York for 30 years does to you. I moved there when I was 18 for university, but I didn't expect to stay there for much longer afterwards. Lovely. So, why did you stay there, Mrs Johnston? Is it because you don't like the English weather and it's very lovely and very hot over there? Well, I fell in love, had two children, usual story. Sister Prue, does Abigail not have many visitors? Well, to be honest, I didn't know Sister Abigail had any family, let alone a real sister. She's never mentioned it, and no one's visited her for as long as I've been in the convent. So I just put two and two together and got... One, two, three... Well, you know. Yeah, I know. She means an awful lot to us here. Well, to me at least. When I first came here, we became bosom buddies. <gasps> I tried to look after her as much as I can taking in her newspaper, bringing her cups of tea, making her beds. <gasps> oh, and on her birthday, always make sure to get her a bouquet of flowers, lots of flowers. And I sit there at the edge of her bed and sing her, her birthday song like this. <clears throat> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, I, sister. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Prue. I, I already know how that goes on. Tell you the truth, I always thought that Sister Abigail's nearest and dearest, well, that she didn't have a nearest and dearest, not outside this convent at least. I wouldn't exactly say I'm her nearest and dearest, but family's family. In the end, there's no getting away from them. <laughs> so, Sister Prue. Yes? Have you lived here long? I don't seem to recall you being here last time I visited. Well, Mrs Johnston, I've lived here a dozen years now. That means 12. And this November, it'll be a baker's dozen. And that means 13. And that's quite a long time. But for one, two, three, four, five years before that, I lived in a convent in Wales, but I didn't like it much there. They put too much milk in your tea and ugh, you had to use margarine to butter your toast. Yuck. So then I left. Well, I ran, really. And once I started, I couldn't stop. I ran for miles. And miles, and miles, and miles, and miles, and Until... miles. Until? Until I found this place. They said I had to do a year's training, which is what I did. I realised that it was the right order for me because I like looking after people and there's lots of people for me to look after here. I especially like looking after Sister Abigail. I'm glad you care for Abigail. I mean, someone's got to. What do you mean? Well, obviously, I care for her. But? 
Who says there's a but? Sister Frances, when she had her marbles, used to say you can tell by someone's intonation. Your voice goes up and then goes down at the end of a sentence. Your voice didn't go down, Mrs Johnston. It stayed up. Right. That's how I could tell. Well... Sister Frances sounds like she was a very clever woman. I suppose she's lived here for a long time? Sister Frances also used to say that you can tell when someone doesn't want to answer a question because they degrease. Digress. Um, fine then. Uh, ooh, where to start with Abigail? To be honest, Sister Prue, she upped and left us all so suddenly I just felt... Uh, I don't know... We were so close one minute and then the next. You felt abandoned? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. I haven't seen her all that much since she left. Not properly. The first few years we were here, we had to see each other behind iron bars. They're very liberal now, Mrs Johnston. We can even shake the hands of our guests. Well, not in coronavirus times, obviously. Well, they certainly weren't like that back then. My mother couldn't stand how conservative everything was. I did come to visit her a few times, but it didn't really turn out as intended. And it's not like I came here to England all that often. Abigail is rather argumentative and, well, so was my mother. You couldn't visit her on your own? My mum didn't allow it. She was firm, controlling, and as for Abigail, <laughs> was a bit of a head case back then. Sister Catherine, she's the mother superior, says that we shouldn't be impertinent about the other sisters. Impertinent? Oh, um, impertinent means not showing proper respect, like rude or insolent. Oh, I, I know, I know what it means, Sister Prue, but I wouldn't be impertinent about Abigail, especially given you obviously think so highly of her. I'm just not really in the business of worship, that's all. So, what are you in the business of then? Oh gosh, uh, I don't know. Worrying about my children, I suppose. Spitting on my hanky and wiping tomato sauce off their faces. Oh, that's lovely. How old are your children? Nineteen. Oh, all right. Let me write that one down. Oh, you know I'm going to have to do a family tree to work out how you're all related. So, your first name is... Judith. And your sister Abigail's sister? Yes. Well, half-sister, actually. Does that mean she's your sister and your cousin? No, not quite. Does that mean she's your sister... And your mother? Uh, no, Sister Prue. Uh, no, I think that would be incest. Uh, oh, no. Uh, how about I write it down for you? I could do a sort of family tree. Hey, look here. Me and Abigail share the same mother. Our mother was called Vera. She had Abigail with a man who was from Peru when she was in her early 20s. Abigail's father then left her and her mother when Abigail was only three years old. Then my mother had me with a man who I still actually haven't met before. Just a name on a birth certificate. Now, for the next generation, Abigail didn't have any children, but I had two children with a man called Stephen. And I'm a bit confused. Uh, where did you get lost? What's Peru? Maybe we should do the family tree another time. Oh, all right. So... Are you here for any reason? Or just to say hello and to hug Sister Abigail? Hug her? Yes. I hope not. I mean, I've come to say hello, but we don't really do physical affection in our family. Oh, that's strange. I hug everyone at the Priory. They call me Sister Bear. Lovely. And no, Sister Prue, I'm not here to celebrate, sadly. Our mother passed on three months ago, so I sent a letter to tell Abigail. I know she's in clothes, so I didn't expect her to make it to the funeral, but I think she's asked me to come here so we can discuss inheritance. So I decided to bring mum here, and here mum is. 
Here mum is. Inside the space. How? Because she's dead. Your mother's dead? Well, they'd have one heck of a job getting her in there if she wasn't. I did say she'd passed on. Yes, but, well, I didn't know you meant from one life to the next. I thought you meant like she passed on a bug or something. I'm sorry to hear that. That must be very upsetting for you, Mrs Johnston. To be honest, at the moment, I feel more curious than upset. There's so many things I realized I never asked her when she was alive. She was such a private woman. But the things she'd done and the places she'd gone to were incredible. She was a jazz singer back in the day. She used to travel the world on tour. She said Frank Sinatra once chatted her up in a bar in Australia. Really? Yes, apparently. Fancy that! I know. Who's Frank Sinatra? Is he someone famous? Uh, yes, you could say that. Mum was prone to exaggerating, though. You had to take what she said with a pinch of salt. Sometimes more than a pinch. A spoonful. Sometimes even more than that. Her career went south after she had Abigail. She had to throw the towel in. She did all her jobs here and there after that, but... I don't know. I don't think she ever really got over it, you know? Got over what? How far she slumped. How the mighty fall, huh? I wasn't particularly close to my mother, and, well, as for Abigail and her... Well? Well, they were such opposites. My mother was a disciplinarian, and Abigail was, well, ungovernable. That's why it was such a surprise when she came here. My mother used to say, when Abigail entered that convent, they let the devil himself over their threshold. The devil? Oh no, Sister Abigail is an angel of light. You only have to look at her to see the goodness shine out. Not before she started doing three Hail Marys before breakfast every morning. Uh, I don't know, it could be all tittle-tattle. It was all such a long time ago, and there's a big age gap. Fifteen years. I'm the younger one, in case you hadn't realised. Oh, of course I did. Fifteen years, Mrs Johnston. Wow. That's a long time. Yes, well, I say fifteen. I mean fifteen and two-thirds. Actually, no. Fifteen and nine months. Nine months out of twelve is fifteen and three quarters. So I suppose if you round it up, it's sixteen years. Yes, she's sixteen years older than me. If it's all the same to you, Mrs. Johnston, I'm, I might not write that one down. So when you say your mother's inside that vase... Yes. You mean her spirit is? She's in the vase, she's in the cupboard, she's everywhere. No, no, she's in there now. In there? Right now? This minute? Uh, oh, Mrs Johnston, I might have to sit down. I'm beginning to feel a bit giddy. <laughs> it's all right, Sister Prue. It's all quite normal, I promise. I don't understand. How did you get her in that vase? Well, she was cremated. Cremated? That means you've buried her, doesn't it? No, no. A cremation is when you burn the body and then you, you place or scatter the ashes somewhere. You burned her? Well, there's no wonder she's dead. No, Sister Prue. She died and then we had a ceremony and then we had the cremation. Now I've just got to work out what to do with her. So, so she's inside the vase? Not for pretend, but for real. For real. I don't understand. Why would you burn her? Sometimes that's what people do. Well, not what people do to themselves. That's called self-immolation and is frowned upon in most societies. 
Cremation is something that people ask to be done to them after they die. Uh, sometimes the ashes are buried, sometimes they're scattered somewhere that, that might be special to the person who's died. And sometimes their loved ones keep them for sentimental reasons, you know, like on the mantelpiece or something. Oh, we don't burn people here at the Priory. The body is very important to us Catholics. You're not in Kansas anymore, Mrs Johnston, remember that? New York. Sorry? I'm from New York. Same thing, isn't it? Not really. And we do have Catholics in the States. Do you? Yes. And my mother wasn't Catholic. She actually resented the idea of religion. You can imagine the look of horror on her face when Abigail told her she wanted to come here. She didn't have what you might call a, a spiritual presence. Oh, we all have a spiritual presence, Mrs Johnston. My mother never went to mass a day in her life, but sometimes when I'm doing the hoovering, I can feel her presence. Prudence, you've missed a spot in the corner. Hoover it up properly, is what I hear her say. So I always make sure I leave the carpet spick and span. She was a great woman, Mrs Johnston. She founded the Times newspaper. Really? Yeah, I think so. Goodness me, your family must be very famous. Or maybe it was that she found the Times newspaper. Auntie Winnie was always leaving it in the bathroom, bless her. That's not as good, is it? Hmm, not quite. Funny. I thought I've heard my mum a couple of times too. And there was me thinking I'd finally got rid of the old pet. It brings back so many memories coming back here. I remember that time we came to visit. It was a few months after Abigail had joined. I didn't want to go at all, but mum insisted. I saw Abigail coming down the stairs. Ugh, it was so strange. She had gone from wearing crop tops and bikini bottoms to, well, pretty much what you're wearing now. <laughs> I couldn't go through with it. The visit, that is. I took one look at Abigail and ran over to the windowsill in the parlor room. I bawled my eyes out. It was almost like grief. I knew nothing would be the same again. Not between me and Abigail. I'm not sure if it was this place exactly. It all looks so different. I wore sunglasses back then, so everything just seems to have a lot more... color. You were wearing sunglasses in the convent? I was blind back then. Well, I still am blind, really. I can't see out of the right one. They corrected the left one when I was 14, but before that it was pretty ineffectual. I see. Well, I'm glad one of us can. Oh no, Mrs Johnston, I meant I'm only teasing. <laughs> I came to see her again, Abigail, I mean, one more time. It was about 15 years ago now. I brought my children, little Johnny and Flora. I thought it only proper that she meet her niece and nephew. We had a nice enough time. We talked for a few hours, back and forth banter. You know how it is with Abigail. But I saw my mum after, and when I told her I'd gone to see Abigail, she saw red. She was incandescent with rage even threw a vase at me, ironically enough. You don't see that woman again, you understand, she said. But she's my sister, I said. It must be so hard for her, all cooped up in that convent with no contact with the outside world. I cried. Mum sighed, then came over to me. Abigail made her choice. She chose to leave us. Remember that, Mum said. And after that, it felt easier to keep a distance. Looking back on it, though, I shouldn't have done that. Not to Abigail. It was so selfish of me. I was so selfish. But I just, I wanted to keep the peace and the harmony between me and Mum, at least. Oh, dear. 
You must be thinking I'm such a bad sister. Why would you think that? You've been here a baker's dozen years, and I haven't bothered to visit in all that time. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, Mrs. Johnston. Sister Abigail is always saying that my voice activates before my mind engages, so I've got to be very careful about what goes into my mouth. Or was it what comes out of my mouth? The latter, I would have thought. <laughs> anyway, uh, do you think she'll be ready now? I'll go and see if she's in the parlour. <laughs> Sister Abigail, how are you this morning? You're beaming like a vibrant ray of sunshine, as always. Are you feeling hungry? You haven't eaten for a few hours. I could bring you some sandwiches. I know you didn't like the marmite and jam one I made for you, but perhaps I could try a different recipe. Thank you, Sister Prue. Your assistance is always so well-intentioned, but that's quite all right. If you could tell Judith I'm ready for her now, I'll let you know if there's anything else I need. If you want to go in, she's ready for you. Thank you, Sister Prue. Good morning. Is it? I wouldn't know. It's been a long time, Abigail. Fifteen years. A pair of knitted stockings to your twins after Christmas. Never get a thank you note. That's your husband's manners, I assume. I'm sorry about that. Things, they got a bit... hectic, I suppose. How convenient. Nightmare journey? I'd tell you all about it, but you probably wouldn't listen. Mm, I've already stopped. Why don't you take a seat, Judith? Judy, please. I've been Judy since I was in pigtails. Very well. Judy. Should I be mother? Sorry? Tea, Judith. Would you like some tea? Is that what you say to all your victims? I'm only being hospitable. Well, yes, uh, if it's no trouble. None at all. Sister Prue! Yes, Sister Abigail? Sister Prue, could we have two pots of tea, please? Of course, Sister Abigail. Do you take your tea with sugar and milk? Oh, yes, yes, I do. Sister Prue! Yes, Sister Abigail? Could you please bring us some sugar and milk? And some of my favourite biscuits? My dear sister looks as if she didn't eat anything for the whole journey, and we certainly can't have her sitting on an empty stomach now, can we? Your favourite biscuit? Oh, the chocolate bourbons you like? That's the one. Oh, Sister Prue, none for me. I ate a cookie on the way here, so I'm good. Cookie? Yes. What's cookie? Never mind, Sister Prue. You can get the chocolate bobbins for me. Tickety-boo. Two cups of tea and a packet of bobbins. Two cups of tea and a packet of bobbins. I was glad to receive your letter, Abigail. Or, should I say, Sister Abigail. I know it's been a long time. This place hasn't changed much, though. No. Well, it's not in keeping, is it? In keeping with what? The times. Change. Modernity. They've changed the decor slightly, but... Mm, it's like making a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Yes, I suppose so. Those curtains certainly want replacing. Oh, and the carpet's seen better days. I can't say I noticed. You're probably wondering why I asked you here today. Yes, I am. It wasn't to discuss interior design, nor was it to drink cups of tea through pursed lips. Though I'd hold your breath on that front. Sister Prue isn't exactly what I'd call the domestic type. I didn't think that either. Why do you think I asked you here, then? You said, well, wrote, in your letter. Wrote? That you wanted to tell a story. That still doesn't answer my question. Sorry? 
What you think and my stated reason could be two very different things. Why don't you just tell me? Why do you think I'm not telling you? I have no idea. Well, the truth is, I did want to tell you a story. There you go. But before you start to tell a story, you really have to get to know the characters. I don't understand. Good. I never try to understand anything. It's called having an open mind. I thought maybe you'd want to talk about Mum. I can't think what gave you that thought. But now that I've thought about it, I think it makes sense. Well, the thing is, Abigail, I'm sort of here on her behalf. Her legs, you mean? You're here on behalf of her legs? Sorry? Well, that's the better half, isn't it? I'd rather that than the top half. That would have to include her mouth and a serbic tongue to accompany it. So, the only half you could possibly be talking about is the half that contains her two bloated legs and the country from which we both came from. Country? Cockpit? Duck pond? Bad cave? Lady bits? Pink panther? Pussycat? Do you have to be so vulgar? Vulgar? What? Am I not allowed to say any of those words anymore? Oh, forgive me. Is it too improper to say that sort of thing, or with all this political correctness? I think it was improper to say that before political correctness was even invented. You're a Carmelite nun, Abigail. Start acting like one. Ah, I can't stand it, you know. All this sanctimonious nonsense. Young people thinking they know better, telling us that we need to be controlled and subservient to their nonsense. I read in the newspaper the other day, you aren't allowed to use the word naughty anymore. Really? It's banned. Shush, they might hear you. Who? The thought, please. <laughs> you might laugh, Judith. But apparently, naughty is a very naughty word, only used by naughty people. It was originally contrived to mean the poor, people who literally had naught. Those at the bottom of the pile, who were plagued with associations of promiscuity and thievery. So now, saying naughty apparently makes you guilty of being an uptight, uncharitable, stuck-up little snob. Although, that's me all over. In fact, I was thinking of calling my memoirs that. I'll take your word for it. And for the record, Judith, Mum called me a lot worse than a duck pond and a bat cave. Honestly, Abigail, can't you give her a break? I mean, she is dead. Oh, don't I know it? I can just see her now, at the gates of heaven, telling Christ himself how gorgeous his cheekbones are, just so she can charm her way in. Yes, well, I'm sorry to say that Mum's not in heaven. She's right here, in this vase, on this table. Here we pronounce it vase. A bit too classy for her, though, don't you think? Why do people do it? Do what? Ask to get cremated. Why would you voluntarily decide to reduce anything that you thought you were worth to some quintessence of dust? Like that's all you ever were. All right, Hamlet. Next thing you'll be asking me whether it's better to be or not to be. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil? <laughs> I have no idea. Huh. Cremation. Why would someone want such a thing? Funny. Sister Prue asked me the exact same thing. And you said? I said that sometimes when people die, they like the thought of being scattered somewhere that's special to them. I'm afraid we Catholics don't believe in it. The body that lies in death recalls the personal story of faith, the past relationships, and the continued spiritual presence of the deceased person. Where would you want your ashes scattered? I, 
I don't know, Abigail. What's with all the questions? Well, there's no harm in speculating. Well, I can't say I ever really thought about it. Crete, maybe? That's where me and Steve honeymooned. I don't believe in it myself. You never know. We might all be resurrected one day, and it'll be the cynics like Mum who'll miss out on that. <laughs> Although that might not be such a bad thing. I suppose they bury the sisters in the garden here? Oh, yes. I've got it all sorted out. The gravestone, the priest, the recitals. I could trip over now, it'll all be sorted. No expense spared. I'll have a splendid crowd out there morning. Have you thought about converting? No, I have not. Well, you should be mindful of it, especially when you get to your age. I'm 49. Exactly. You're basically brown bread already. Death is death, Judith. There's no escaping death. I'm only trying to express my concern. Well, thanks for that. But in case you forgot, you're actually 15 years older than me. Yes, but... Well... There's a bit of a difference, isn't there? In what way? I've spent the last 40 years praying five times a day and doing a Hail Mary every morning before breakfast. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. You, on the other hand, God isn't going to bless you with a long and healthy life unless you show some commitment to him. Oh, yes, and, and talking about your mother's duck pond and bat cave is really showing a commitment to God. Have you ever picked up a Bible? You see, Judith, the way I see it, God doesn't want you to be dishonest. I'm not going to make myself mealy-mouthed just because some tree-hugging, overly sensitive snowflake student who has far too much time on their hands and who can recite Des Capital like there's no tomorrow might be offended. I am an unashamedly, unsuppressed, honest, down-to-earth Catholic woman I'm a free agent, Judith, and I would encourage you to join me. There's no harm in doing it, you know. Just in case. You remember Uncle Peter, don't you? Mum's godforsaken cousin a million times removed. He found out he had stage three cancer. Within a week, he was received, christened and confirmed, and within a fortnight was already in remission. You know, Sister Prue might hear you. She wouldn't want to hear all this talk of death. She obviously thinks you're only second to Jesus. She's not the only one. As a matter of fact, they all happen to think that I'm amazing here. And they're right. Put her away, Judith. I've seen enough of her already. I don't think the garden could take it if we scattered her there. She'd probably only start haunting the rose petals or something. That'll be your job when you're gone. Exactly. And there are enough Johnstons here to last a lifetime. How about you throw her ashes in the face of Peter Hitchin? She could never stand him. I don't know how he'd feel about that. Maybe I could leave the ashes here. I'm sure the sisters could do something with them, make it into a shrine or, or something. We don't do cremation, remember? Anyway, she's your responsibility, not mine. You bought her here, after all. Yes, well, she was mother to us both, wasn't she? You sure about that? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. How did it play out? The events surrounding her death, I mean. How did it play out? It wasn't some sort of TV drama, Abigail. I'm, I'm sure it was very upsetting. Who found her? The carer, apparently. She went to her room for an afternoon nap but her afternoon nap turned into an evening nap, and at about half past eight, the carer found her there. So the carer found her? Yep. Well, you know how the saying goes, finders keepers. Finders keepers? Yes. When something is unowned or abandoned, he who finds it first is responsible for whatever it might be. If the carer found her, the carer can deal with her. And we can put an end to this nonsense. Finders keepers about our mother's dead body? Abigail, have some respect. On the contrary, I'm only following the saying. And the saying says the carer can deal with it. Finders keepers is what you say to a kid after they found a, a pound coin on the ground. 
not about who discovered their mother's corpse. Of course. Pound coins. Pound coins? Pound coins. That'll sort this out once and for all. You don't happen to have any coins on you, or dollars, or whatever pretend money you use in America. I would get one myself, but I get everything for free here. Here you go. Perfect. Right. Heads say I take the ashes. Tails say you take them back to the carer. Fine. Tails, take her away. It's best out of three. Excuse me? I always do best out of three. You didn't say that before. Well, I'm saying it now. I'll go again. Oh. What does it say? <sighs> Tails. Judith, the coin has spoken. She's your responsibility. Fine. Well, I've got something else for you. She left it to you in her will, which means you can't find her keepers your way out of it. She wrote something weird to go with it, though. Oh, really? And what was that? I've got it written here. To my eldest daughter, Sister Abigail Hillary Johnston, I leave this entity in the hope that she will remember her sins and lawless deeds forevermore. Then it says, sink beneath the surface, be overwhelmed, succumb to the sea. And then it's got a five in brackets at the end. Um, well, I've got no idea what she m means by that. It's got nothing to do with what she left you as well. Hang on. The five in brackets. That could be a crossword clue or something. Mom was always doing those. S swamped, maybe. No, no, that's seven letters. Uh, submerged. Is eight. Look, whatever this gift might be, you do realize I don't want it. I've got it here, you know. Got what? Your inheritance. I said... I know what you said, but you must be curious. No. Nope. Here it is. Do you know what it is? I wasn't born yesterday. What I mean is, do you recognize it? This? No. Eh? I wonder why she decided to leave it to you. I haven't the foggiest. Well, do you want it? Want it? Why would I want it? It's broken. See, the clock stuck at quarter to eight. Fine, I'll take it back then. Good. How did you know it was stuck? I don't know. Have you seen this before? No. Are you sure? Certainly. How sure? Twelve mm, percent? That's not very sure. Isn't it? Well, Mum obviously left it to you for some reason, but I can't think why. Neither can I. I just don't know what her intention would be. Why leave this to you, of all things? Ha! Intention! The only intention that woman ever had was to spite others, miserable cow! She left me this so she could bully and intimidate me. Wheedle her way into my mind, beyond the grave. Why would leaving you a watch in her will bully and intimidate you? I don't know. Abigail, please. I want to get to the bottom of all this. Bottom of all what? All of these little odd things that just don't stack up. Why Mum left you this watch? What exactly she did to you that you can't forgive her for? And what she meant by what she wrote in her will? Remember your sins and lawless deeds forevermore. That's gotta mean something. There's clearly something that I'm not being told. Mouse! Sister Prue? There's a mouse! Where? In the corridor! Oh, Sister Prue, it's only a mouse. I hate mice. Come here, Sister Prue. There are no mice in here. Now, I've got a joke for you. It's a terrible one, you know. Why do mice only stay inside when it rains? Um, I don't know, Sister Abigail. Because it's raining cats and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got a 
a joke for you. Go on. So, there were three boys. Or was it four boys? I can't remember. So, there were three or four boys, and they were all on a rowing boat. Or was it a barge? Anyway, these three or four boys who were either on a rowing boat or a barge all had cigarettes. Or cigars, maybe? Anyway, so these three or four boys who were all on this rowing boat slash barge were all trying to smoke their cigarettes or cigars. But none of these boys, however many of them there were, had a lighter or a match. So one of these boys decided to throw a cigarette off the rowing boat. So the boat actually became a cigarette lighter. (laughs) Oh, do you get it? Not as often as I like. We do live in a convent, remember? Oh, Sister Abigail, you are funny. What do you call a woman who can balance beer bottles on her head? Oh, um, I don't know, Sister Abigail. Beatrix. (laughs) (laughs) Judith, please, can you not near cough? Please, can you far cough? Oh, Sister Abigail, that's a rude one. Do you know, thinking about it, I don't know why I'm so scared of my Sister Abigail. They're so small and fluffy and they never hurt anyone. Well, you have many anxious demons, Sister Prue. Not all of them are rational. You were afraid of me when you first came here, do you remember? And then I helped you with your recitals. And we care for each other, don't we? Even if you do get the hiccups every now and then when we're meant to be doing communion. (laughs) Now, are you scared of mice? No. Because what is it we fear most in life? The thing we fear most in life is... Fear itself. That's my girl. Now, you can go and get the tea for me and Judith. Are you all right? Fine. I just... What? Well, seeing you and Sister Prue like that, it made me... sad. It brought back a lot of memories, and not all of them bad, for once. You were a bit like a mother to me. You think? Yeah, in your own way. Bit of an immature one, maybe. But you cared in a way that Mum just wasn't able to. And I still do. I never stopped praying for you, you know. And then... You just left. Just like that. I waited for you to come back for me. I used to bunk off school because I was scared that you were going to come back while I was away. Mum said you were gone for good, but I thought, no. Not Abigail. Not my amazing big sister. She wanted to just leave me. Not forever. Not me. Judith, I... Then I realized Mum was right. I felt upset, let down by my own flesh and blood. Then I stopped feeling sad, and I got angry instead. I started misbehaving at school, bunking off, smoking in the toilets, shouting at the teachers. I missed you so much. You were my safety net, my rock. Don't you remember what it was like? Mom going out every Friday night, coming home drunk, shouting at us, swearing at us, throwing punches at at me. What? She threw punches at me. She never laid a finger on you. You were the precious, blue-eyed little daughter she actually wanted, whereas me? Oh, I was nothing but a dirty, nasty, treacherous little slut as far as she was concerned. So, how do you think it was after you left us? Do you think she just stopped flying off the handle? Do you think you were the only punching bag lying around? She hit you. I never knew. Oh, the absolute... What? The absolute what, Abigail? 
Mum may have been many things, but at least she never actually abandoned me. I never knew she laid a finger on you. Well, you wouldn't, though, would you? Because all I ever got from you after you left was a lousy birthday card once a year, a flimsy bouquet of flowers on my wedding day, and some prayers. Fat lot of good they did me. Those dandelions were expensive, thank you very much. Do you know what it's like being in this place? Having to do the same thing day after day... I've learnt to accept it here. What else can I do? I used to look out to this window, and I'd wish that I could be out there living a normal life. Short deadlines, miniskirts, office jobs, boyfriends, pram shops, everything could have been so much more... normal. And I'd look out this window and see the world go by... All I ever heard from you in your letters was how amazing your life was going. How you got a scholarship and were living it up in New York and working and getting married and having friends and making babies whilst I was in this... this never-ending stagnation. Why did you come here then? Oh, later, Judith, later. What you said earlier. About me leaving you. Yes. Well, it's not as if you ever saw fit to come and see me. You haven't visited in so long. I wanted to. I did, truly. I, I did, but the, the cost of flying over and, and having to get off work... There's no point in lying. I know you visited England, Mum told me in a letter. Well, if you want to know the truth... Mum told me not to visit you. She what? She told me not to visit. And I was quite comfortable doing that. After you joined this place, I couldn't even look you in the eye anymore. You, with your your scapular and your headpiece, your whole disposition just felt different. Like you'd lost your Abigailness. <sighs> to be fair... You couldn't look anyone in the eye at that age. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I could make neither head or tail of it when you were a toddler. One eye looking at you, the other one looking for you. Made staring competitions very disconcerting. Staring competitions. Flora used to love those. She'd always clap her hands in front of me and that was me out. Flora, the girl, your daughter... How is she? And the boy? How's he doing? Yeah, both of them are fine. Great, even. They've just turned 19, Johnny's just started at Ohio, and Flora's going to university next year. Steve just got a promotion at the law firm he works at, so he's managed to pay for all the tuition. Ah, the famous Steve. How are you both doing? We're great. As a couple, I mean. Like I said, we're great. Really? No problems at all? All couples have their troubles. Well, thanks for raising your concern, but we're doing just fine. Thanks. He's not having an affair, is he? No. Wh why should he be? I don't know. Well, it's not like you're getting any younger. I can see your roots coming through, by the way. You never know. His eyes might be wandering. Well, they're not. We've been married for 21 years now, and it's been... 21 years of love, loyalty, and commitment. So, thanks for asking, but we are just standy. That's what all couples say. And then, when it falls to pieces, they tell a completely different story. I don't mean to pry, Judith. Only our family doesn't have form on long-lasting relationships. You probably don't remember our Auntie Bertha... Well, I say auntie. She was only married to Uncle Al from Lent till Easter. They wed in the February, thought they'd be together for the rest of their naturals. Two months later, she ran off and joined a cult. Sort of woman you never really expected to do anything spontaneous. Do you think we could talk about something else? Fine by me. The children have really grown up. 
That does tend to happen. Well, to most of us at least. I'm something of an exception. They've really both matured. Johnny's even got a girlfriend now. It's the early days, but... Well, I think he might have found himself a keeper. You know when you could just tell? Mother's intuition and everything. I'm glad to hear they're both happy. You must have pictures of them or something? Oh, wow. Look at them. They look so happy. I never knew the twins were into scuba diving. Did you ever get over your fear of water? I'm afraid not. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid you might drown? Uh, yeah, I suppose. I am sorry. What have you got to be sorry for? It's my fault, you see. I drowned you. Well, I say drowned. It was all completely accidental. I was washing you one evening. You were only a baby. Hyperactive, diddy little thing you were. Mum was downstairs making dinner. It was always my responsibility to wash you. It was about quarter to eight, as I recall. It was only for a moment. A second, even. But you slipped out of my hands and fell into the water. Splash! Please, could we talk about something else? I'm feeling a bit... Clumsy <sighs> little thing you were. Hyperactive little thing. Falling into the water like that. Stop it! Here we go, two pots of tea. One for lovely sister Abigail and one for her lovely sister Judith. Would you like anything else? Sister Prue, thank you so much. Oh, the sugar and milk. Did you remember? Oh, silly me. That must have slipped right out of my mind. I didn't have it written down. Really? I write everything down, see. Is that right? I forgot to write it down. No problem. Let me get the sugar and milk for you now. Sugar and milk, sugar and milk, sugar and milk for you now. Uh, don't forget the bourbon, Sister Prue. Sugar and milk, sugar and milk, sugar and milk and some chocolate bourbon. I'm sorry about that, Judith. I didn't realise it was still a phobia of yours. That's all right. Uh, maybe we should change the subject. Uh, of course. Flora's very easy on the eyes, isn't she? And that red hair, so wild. It matches her personality. She's very passionate. She comes from a long line of steely women, after all. She started teething very early, which Steve's mum always said was a sign that they aren't afraid to be confrontational when they get older. Ugh, it was so painful on the breast. <laughs> Oh, please, don't remind me of those little nips. They were traumatising. Well, what are you talking about? You wouldn't know what that felt like. You never had any children. Right? Here we go. Here we have some sugar, and here we have some milk. Bourbons. Sorry? You forgot the chocolate bourbons. Oh, so I did. What am I like? I should have written it down, see. I'll be back in a moment. Chocolate bourbons, chocolate bourbons. Let me go get some chocolate bourbons. I bet Sister Isabel ate them all. She's always doing that. Great big walloping article she is. I never go to breakfast after Sister Isabel's been down there. There's nothing left. I'm still waiting for an answer. Don't tell the other sisters I said that, though. About the child. The child that you breastfed. Sister Prue would never believe me. Can you just answer my question? I don't know why you care so much. So what? It's a baby. It's only a little creature with four dangling limbs, a wailing voice, and a... So you had a baby? You had a baby that you breastfed. Will you please get off the breastfeeding? Anyone would think you had some sort of Oedipal complex. So, so, so who is this child? Where are they? And who on earth impregnated you anyway? The Pope? Steady on. I didn't exactly look like the elephant man back then. In fact, all the boys used to say I had the eyes of Marilyn Monroe. Was it a girl or a boy? Who impregnated me? 
No, who you gave birth to. Judith, there's a story I've been wanting to tell you. A long and complicated story. Oh, give me strength. If you just wait for the ending, I think you might be interested. Hang on. Does this story have something to do with the child? Well, there's no point in me telling you this story if I spoil the ending. You've got to build the tension up first. Up, up, up until the characters come crashing down, down, down and land up in a convent of all places. But I might give you a clue and be a literary tease. It's a real nail-biter. So, are you sitting comfortably? Yes. Then I'll begin. Judith, I want to say why I'm telling you this story. Let's call it the preface, or the introduction. I've been wanting to tell you this story for a long, long time. I'm all ears. Good. Let's start with ears. Actually, no. Let's start with a little girl. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there was a young girl called... Oh, do you want to give this girl a name? Oh, for God's sake. That's not a very nice name. Poor creature. You're not going to leave her without a name, are you? Fine. Uh, Poppy. Why don't you call her Poppy? Poppy. Fantastic. Poppy's going to be the main protagonist. So, Poppy was trying to find her Prince Charming. You see, Poppy had kissed many of the local boys. Not just plain old pretty boys. Boys who drove motor trucks. Boys who bedizened their arms with armlets and unendurable tattoos. Sometimes she did a little more than just kiss them. Sometimes she did a little more than just kiss the local girls, too. And on the odd occasion, she did a little more than just kiss the local boys and girls at the same time. Is this really relevant? Well, it's important for character development. I want to present you a fully rounded, lifelike character. It might help you sympathize or understand why Poppy did some of the things she did. You see, Poppy's promiscuity stemmed from an innate burning desire to be loved. Poppy had a wicked, wicked mother at home, you see, who never really loved her. In fact, she despised her most of the time, so much so that she used to scream at her late at night, What have I done to deserve this life? I've got a whore strutting in at stupid o'clock every night, and I meant to tell the neighbours she's my daughter. Poppy hated that house. It was a corner house in a pretty dismal state. The outside was red brick, frowned upon by tiny barred windows like evil, angry eyes and a crooked-eyed door that you had to kick open. It made Poppy feel like she was marooned, stuck in some inescapable prison where her mother had thrown away the key. But it wasn't all bad. Poppy had school, her getaway. That was where she met her Prince Charming. She became starry-eyed and besotted with a seventeen-year-old village boy called Bill. That seemed to match his unaffordable lifestyle of regularly inebriating himself and buying petrol by the gallon. They met at a dance. Bill and his friends used to race against each other in their cars, and Poppy would join too. On her fifteenth birthday, she decided to make her love obvious to Bill that evening in the back of the car. Uncomfortable, perhaps, but there was something thrilling about how spontaneous it was. Then they went for another spin in the car. It felt amazing. The constant reverberation pulsating through the body. The feeling of the wind racing through her hair. It was all so satisfying. Afterwards, Bill and Poppy started talking. They got on to talking about their families. Bill had had a pretty traditional upbringing. Dad in the army, 
Mum was a seamstress by trade, but devoted most of her time to looking after her children. Always made an afternoon tea on a Sunday, without question. Then Poppy told Bill about her mother. How she'd felt abandoned. How her mother hated her. Bill could see how upset Poppy was about her family circumstances, and sang to Poppy an escapist song about the pair of them running away from the town and going to live far, far away. Um, a gentle breeze from Hushabye Mountain softly blows over Lullaby Bay. It fills the sails of boats that are waiting, waiting to sail our worries away. Poppy knew from then on what she wanted. She wanted Bill's hand in marriage. For better or for worse, for richer, for poorer. But then one rainy night, Bill and Poppy found themselves in trouble. They went down to the valleys again in Bill's car. Faster, 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 Poppy said loudly, screaming over the roar of the engine. I want to see skid marks in the tracks tomorrow morning. As Bill stepped down in the accelerator, the car pushed forward and ran down the long and windy road, down through the darkened roads of the valley, and across the bridge that ran over the stream. But the bridge was too narrow, and the car fell off into the water. She wasn't wearing her safety belt. She flew right across the car. Her head smashed through the front screen. Everything was happening so quickly. She started to panic and breathed in the water. Her lungs were slowly being filled with horrible, dirty river water. The more she panicked, the more she couldn't breathe, but the pain didn't last long because... After that, there was... Well... Blackness. Pitch blackness, like nothing actually existed, like matter and time and light and shade had never come into being, and all the other things that go with it, rainy days, bus pipes, bus tickets, None of it. A whole world of just nothing. All the trivialities of life, gone. It wasn't scary. It wasn't sad. It was just... It was just what it was. Then, as Poppy experienced the quietude of the nothingness and the colour of death then in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Poppy was saved the water left her lungs like a pump flying out of her mouth she started to hear noises the song of the ambulance the cry of her mother the sound of the doctor saying, It's unlikely your daughter will pull through. But still, blackness. Poppy had descended into a long, long sleep. She woke up a few days later. But she could feel this peculiar sense of emptiness. Her wicked mother was sitting next to her. You've been in a car accident. You've broken both your legs. You're very lucky to be alive. But by this point, all Poppy wanted to know was where Bill was. Bill, Bill, where is he, she murmured. Bill's dead, Abigail. He broke his neck in the accident. That's what happens when you drive around like a lunatic. 
Poppy felt as if all the emotion and feeling in her body had been wrenched out and displaced by an emptiness. A physical emptiness. But she really wasn't prepared for what her wicked mother was about to say next. I told you. I told you you'd get into trouble. Now you've only gone and got yourself pregnant. She looked down. Her body didn't look impregnated. What was she talking about? And now, now they've only gone and cut it out. Dirty, nasty, treacherous little slut. Poppy was stunned. She didn't know what to say. She didn't know whether she wanted to laugh or cry. After all this time, had she actually been carrying a baby? She was too young and too naive to pick up on the signs. And more than that, it was amazing that the baby had actually survived the crash. Abandoned by Bill, a distraught poppy went to go and see the baby, who had been born so early it had certain... visual impairments. Visual impairments? Poppy and her baby came home a few weeks after. Poppy still said nothing for the first few days. She was traumatised and still completely devastated over the loss of her beautiful, courageous Bill. She was beginning to realise that absence really does make the heart grow fonder. Only the heart had fallen in love with a man who wasn't alive any more. After a few weeks, the baby came home, and Poppy christened the baby Lilith. Lilith would scream the house down, and Poppy would sit in her room and cry. What else could she do? Sing to her? Kiss her? Hold her? And how could she do that? Because she loved her. She tried, but she couldn't. Poppy was limping on a leg that wouldn't heal with a baby that couldn't see. She used to bathe the baby Lilith every day, but then one evening, as she held her in the water, Poppy suddenly saw her Bill's features hovering over the baby's face. But this time he was dead. Poppy was so, so angry that someone she loved so much could disappear so quickly and be replaced by a little wailing creature who she couldn't bring herself to love. And as she stared at Bill, she... She... What? What did she do? She held her. She held her baby down there in one moment of delusion and, and anger. She drowned her? She drowned her own baby? The wicked mother came into the bathroom at that point, horrified, and who could blame her? Poppy and her mother then went downstairs and had a terrible argument. Poppy said she thought that baby Lilith should be sent away to be looked after by a loving, caring family. But instead... I instead... The baby was brought up to be Poppy's sister. This is impossible. This... this can't have happened. It did. Why didn't she say anything? I wanted to. Clearly not enough. Oh, if you only knew! What? The wicked mother went on to say that she had tried for another baby many times with many men, but to no effect. She said that she would adopt Lilith as her own. And the wicked mother was terrifying. And what the wicked mother wanted, the wicked mother got. But she didn't like baby Lilith's name. Lilith was now her daughter. And she would name her daughter after her favourite film star from Oz, otherwise known as Judy Garland. Judith, there's something I should say. When I bathed you that time, 
that awful time when I... It was quarter to eight. So? It was quarter to eight when my watch fell in the bath and you fell in with it. The watch? Yes. Oh my God, the watch. That's what she meant. That's what she said in her will. Drowning. Sink beneath the surface. Be overwhelmed. Succumb to the sea. Five letters. Drown. This is the watch you were wearing the night you drowned me. That's how you knew it was broken. It was. But I don't understand. Why would Mum... I don't know. I really don't. Some sort of sick joke, I expect. Why? Why didn't you say anything? The wicked mother told Poppy that if Lilith ever knew, she would be petrified and run far, far away. Is that why you came here? Yes. When you would cry, I would wail. I used to look at this picture. It was given to me at a religious studies lesson at school. Medieval. Gerard David, I think. It was of the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. When I looked at her, I could see it in her eyes. How strongly she loved him. How she cherished him, adored him, would do anything for him. When a baby is born, a bond manifests between a mother and its child. An unquestionable, unbreakable, never-ending bond. I didn't have that. We didn't have that. I wasn't conscious the first few weeks you were born, and my mental health was at such a low. I knew from that moment I couldn't show you that same love. Not after all the trauma, and the grief, and the loss, and the crying, and the hurt that had been caused. But I realised then that someone did love me. Jesus loved me, and I loved him, and I wanted to go somewhere where I could feel that love, embrace that love, give that love back to our Lord and Saviour. Christ was able to love me in a way that no one mortal person is capable of. I also figured out that after everything that had happened, I could go one of two ways. Hit the bottle and endure a life of self-pitying and inebriation, replicate Mum's life and adopt her unforgivable habits, or find my own way. Live somewhere where I could actually be appreciated, not just treated like the dirt on the bottom of someone's shoe. I appreciated you. I know. And despite what I said, I did love you, Judith. It took a while. But when I started, I never stopped. When the dust settled and the fog started to clear, I could see what was important. I looked into your eyes and I knew I loved you. But I loved you in a way that was forbidden. I loved you as a daughter, not a sister. And Mum, she was a tyrant. She controlled everything in that house, and everything included me and you. She couldn't stand us being close. If ever I cuddled you, she would pinch me, shout at me, tell me how I couldn't possibly care for you on account of my mental health problems. That's terrible. So you must understand, I couldn't tell you anything, Judith, that I had to get away. I understand. You do? I understand why you came here. I understand why you couldn't tell me everything when I was a child. 
I understand the pain you must have gone through. Of course I do. I've got two of my own and they're the two most important things in the world to me. But Sister Frances always says you can tell where there's a but. There's one thing I resent you for, truthfully. Don't blame me for it, though. Go on. Why did you never tell me? I wanted to. Not when I was a child, I get that. But when I was older, when I graduated, when I got married, when I had the twins. I had the twins and you knew, you knew they were your grandchildren and yet you still didn't do anything. You don't know how painful all that was. But the pain became so normal. And the years turned into decades. And the way things were became the way things were. And the thought of ever telling produced so much anxiety. I thought it just wasn't worth it. That it all became so easy to live my life as a lie. <laughs> you lived your life as a lie? What about me? <sighs> so I've looked all over the kitchen and I couldn't find your favourite biscuits, but I did find some custard creams. Now it isn't the best of... Oh, Sister Abigail, why is your sister crying? I have just told her an uncomfortable truth. I'm not her sister. I'm her daughter. And she never told me. Sister Abigail? It's true. I don't understand. Don't worry, Sister Prue. I'll explain everything later. I'm just going to go and see if the chocolate bourbons have been stashed away in the pantry. Sister Catherine's always leaving them there by accident. So then, what am I meant to call you now, Mum? Why didn't you call me Abigail? That's what you've always called me, isn't it? This is so weird. This doesn't have to be bad, you know. Me and you, we can start afresh. No more secrets. No, no more. Which is why I need to say something else. Mm -hmm. oh, I d don't think I can take much more of this. When Bill lost control of the car, just before we both swerved off the bridge, I found out later that he accidentally drove into someone. A little girl who was on her way to confession. You killed someone? Not killed. She was unconscious for a while, but when she woke up, she felt lost. She was never quite the same. She decided to join the Priory in Wales, and then she came here. You mean... No, you couldn't have. Prue? Bill hit into Prue when you crashed the car? I had no idea. Mum only told me about it after we'd got home. But she had always said that the little girl had died. I felt racked with guilt. I didn't want a name, or a backstory, or find out who her family were. It would have just made it all too real for me. It was only until she told me about the accident a few years ago, I put two and two together. I realised when she told me where and when it took place. First March, 1971, Arkham Valley. Oh my, Sister Prue, I didn't realise you were in the room. I, I'm sorry there were no chocolate bourbons in the pantry after all, but here are the custard creams. Oh, look at that, they've fallen all over the floor. What am I like? Only me, silly me, ditzy me, dependent, reliable, stupid of me. How could you? How could you? It was you. It was all you. You nearly killed me. Oh, Sister Prue. What? We all lost so much that night. Please let's not get angry at each that other. Angry? 
Of course I'm angry, you drunk driving, silly little f f f frog. You, you, <laughs> you hurt me. Sister Prue, it wasn't me. It was William, Bill, Judas' father. He was driving the car. Oh, yeah, right. Let's turn this on me, daughter of a child killer. I only found out who this Bill was five minutes ago. You didn't have to be in the car. Or, or you could have said to him, you could have said to him that he should park his car or go for a stroll or, or slow down when you went over the bridge or go out and have a picnic if you didn't feel safe. Oh, Prue, I was such a stupid, naive girl. I should have done all those things, but I didn't. Oh, remember the book of Isaiah. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. There's nothing I can do that can stop that night from happening. Let bygones be bygones, Sister Prue, and find it in your heart to forgive me. <laughs> I need to ask something. Yes, of course. Ask anything. I'm afraid you might have to hold off. What? Well, sorry for intruding, but unless you've forgotten, you just dropped a pretty big bombshell on me, too. I've got some important questions to ask, and I have a train to catch an hour, so you and Prue will have to wait to have your domestic a little while longer. Judith, please. Look at the state she's in. If you could just give me five minutes, I'll explain I need to her. you to explain to me. You've got plenty of time to explain to her. I mean, you do both live together here. So, Sister Prue, if you want to, you know, just, just go away. No, Mrs. Johnston. I'm sorry, but I'm staying here and I'm staying until Sister Abigail has told me everything. I've spent my whole life serving other people, doing what's right, putting other people first. This is the first time in ages that something's actually happened to me. It happened 50 years ago. Things are always happening to other people. It's always someone else's story or someone else's gossip that Sister Abigail can tell me about. I'm sorry, Mrs. Johnston, but this time I'm putting myself first. I want to know what happened to me. Now, ladies, please. Ladies, nothing. Abigail wouldn't know the truth if it hurt her. You've spent your whole time here worshipping her, talking to her like she's some sort of goddess, deluding yourself into thinking everything she says is gospel. Everything must be right if Sister Abigail says it is. Well, let me tell you, madam, that's a testament to your intelligence. How could you say that? Now, Judith, you could be a bit more sympathetic. Sympathetic, my foot. Anyone who gives Abigail the white robes of worship is quite obviously deluded. Are you calling me deluded? No, I'm calling you a dum-dum. You're calling me a dum-dum? <laughs> She's calling me a dum-dum. Well, Mrs Johnston, you are nothing but, but, but a big bully. <laughs> Is that really the best you could come up with? Sister Abigail, tell her! Enough! If you two want to brawl like alley cats, then why don't you brawl where you belong in primary school? Or worse still, in nursery? Now, can I get a word in? Don't you see? It's her you should be angry with. Her in this vase, this duck pond, bat cave of a woman, not me. I'm so sorry about the accident, Prue. I shouldn't have allowed Bill to be driving. And I should have got out or told him to slow down. But she, she was such a heartless woman, I would have given the world just to get away from her. Maybe I had a death wish myself. And Judith, I'm sorry for not telling you. But she manipulated me. A poor, innocent teenager who just, just couldn't cope with it at all. I'm sorry to both of you.
You've both borne the brunt of my sins. I suppose that's because I didn't know what virtue really was. I didn't know how to be kind and selfless. I didn't know what it meant to be a good mother because I didn't have one myself. But that's why I'm here. So I can learn. And I can learn to love myself. Forgive myself for everything that I did. And maybe, at some point, in the not-too-distant future, you, both of you, can find it in your hearts to learn to forgive me too. And recognise that I am worthy of redemption. I have to go for Vespers now where we pray for fallen women. God be with you. That means... goodbye. A gentle breeze from Hushabai Mountain softly blows or lullaby bay it fills the sails of boats that are waiting waiting to sail your worries away it isn't far hush by mountain and your boat waits down by the key the winds of night so softly are sighing soon they will fly your troubles to see so close your eyes on Hushabai Mountain Wave goodbye to cares of the day And watch your boat from Hushabai Mountain Sail far away from Lullaby Bay